is Ken Green. I'm with American Enterprise Institute. I was asked to uh, moderate the panel a little while ago, uh, so you'll excuse me if I basically just read from the bios you have in your packet. Um, should be a very interesting presentation this morning. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we talk about mosquitoes and polar bears, which uh, are, are two animals, one being very ugly, one being very cute, and both being very deadly. Um, the fir our first speaker is, uh, is going to be Paul Ryder. He's a professor at the Institut Pasteur in Paris, chief of the Insect and Infectious Disease Unit, a specialist in the natural history and biology of the mosquito, the epidemiology of the diseases they transmit, and the strategies for their control. He has served as chairman of the American Committee of Medical Entomology of the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and of several committees of other professional societies. He's worked for the World Health Organization, but we'll forgive him, the Pan American Health Organization, and other agencies and investigations of outbreaks of mosquito-borne diseases, as well as of AIDS and Ebola hemorrhagic fever and onchocoriasis. Ryder also was a contributory author of the third assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and therefore is a partial Nobel Prize winner, uh, as several others appearing at the conference are uh, today. Paul Ryder. Look, first of all, I don't think the mosquitoes are that ugly because I, I, I rather like them. Anyway, uh, actually, I was given 40 minutes, um, and now it's cut to 20 minutes, so I'm going to have to no, no, speak. Have 40. I have 40. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little slower. Okay, I think you'll be able to understand what I say much more easily than the, uh, uh, than the high-tech uh, climatologists. We, we shall see uh, whether, in fact, you, uh, you do or not. I, I'm going to start with a little bit of history. This, this is a graveyard, okay? Uh, and this here is uh, a gravestone, as you can see, and here is a Culex trap. Uh, it's a trap I devised for studying certain viruses transmitted by mosquitoes, St. Louis encephalitis. And I was working in Memphis, Tennessee. By the way, we're going to come back to this, uh, this cemetery. Working in Memphis, Tennessee, um, collecting mosquitoes in order to isolate viruses. And one day, totally to my surprise, a mosquito appeared in my collection that had never ever been seen before in the Western Hemisphere. It was an Asian mosquito, and we call it now the Asian tiger mosquito. It was unknown uh, to the world before then. It's a very pretty mosquito. I, I, I would say it's as pretty as a polar bear. So, uh, the Asian tiger mosquito uh, was here, and there was just one of them. Uh, the, the local health department said, you, you better not find another of them things, otherwise people might think you put it there. So, so that, that was what happened then. Um, but uh, a couple of years later, uh, uh, we found something else was happening. I, I worked as a merchant seaman for a short time during, while I was a student. And in those days, some time ago, uh, essentially cargoes were unloaded from ships piece by piece. What I realized when I found my one mosquito was that things had changed a great deal. This was the way that things are transported. <clears throat> it was no longer possible to inspect cargoes when they arrived on the wharf side. Um, and so, <clears throat> essentially, uh, the mobility uh, of, of creatures like my mosquito was very much increased. So there was a very sad change uh, in the life of a seaman because essentially he wasn't in port very long. These ships are essentially uh, going around the world very quickly, uh, stopping at ports uh, for a day or so. By now it's quite, quite common for, for, for officers at least to take their wives with them. Uh, and this speed of transportation is another element, uh, I think, in, in, in what uh, I'm about to talk about. Well, in 1985, <clears throat> we at CDC uh, had the uh, message that life was miserable <clears throat> in Houston because of a mosquito that they didn't know about, but later was identified as, as my mosquito, uh, Aedes albopictus. <clears throat> Uh, the kids are getting eaten alive, uh, even the dog goes wild, uh, the, the uh, uh, barbecuing is, is rather difficult. So, so the feds st uh, stepped in. We had a, uh, a meeting down in Houston, Texas. Here you can see us looking over a tire dump. This mosquito really likes to breed in old used tires that contain water. A tire for this mosquito is rather like a tree hole. Uh, these are tree hole breeding forest mosquitoes originally. Actually, I'm I'm right in the center of that picture, would you believe it? Well, because I had the experience with that one mosquito, uh, CDC sent me in the springtime uh, back to, to Houston to look into uh, the, 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 the mosquito. 
Um, and I was doing the sort of things that biologists do, uh, looking at the ecology of the mosquito, finding uh, the productivity of these tires. And one evening, I was amazed to see that there were some people, a couple of guys, who were loading my tires, the tires I was studying, onto the back of a pickup. So I, I went to them. In, in that part of Houston, not a good idea really to go and say, I, I work for the federal government, uh, uh, can you tell me what you're doing? I was naive at the time, uh, but they told me, because I was quite fresh to the States, um, they told me that their, their company export the tires uh, to Guatemala and Mexico. So I thought, oh, that's terrible. Now we know that this mosquito is going to go to areas where dengue, for example, is a major disease. And this, this mosquito can transmit, does transmit dengue, and as we'll come to later, chikungunya. But I asked them, well, how on earth do you have enough tires uh, to ship to these countries? How do you find enough? And they said, well, our company ships them in from India. And I couldn't believe that people would ship in used tires from another continent. In fact, it turned out they were shipping them in from Asia, and that there was essentially a world trade in used tires, a massive world trade in used tires. What we saw was that the Japanese were exporting at that time to 137 different countries used tires from Japan, and that the United States was not too far behind, uh, shipping out to 110 countries. This number of countries has actually increased since the 1980s. These tires are shipped for recapping in some areas, for direct use in, in, in much poorer countries, um, specialist tires like airplane tires and heavy machinery tires go several times to specialists in the United States, uh, etc. We looked at uh, tire shipments in, in Seattle. We found 25% of tires coming from Japan had water in them, and we found five species of mosquitoes. I even found these snow tires at the WHO uh, uh, um, offices in, in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> So now, my mosquito is now in many countries. It's essentially all over the Western Hemisphere, uh, uh, except Canada, Alaska, and Chile. It's in at least 12 countries in Europe. It's really common in countries like Italy. It's now well established in Belgium and in Holland. It's also in Africa. It recently was responsible for transmission in Gabon uh, of, of a, an epidemic of chikungunya virus. It's present in, in Biafra in Nigeria. It's really, oh, it's also in the Beka Valley in Syria, Lebanon. So it's really done very well. Now, you've heard me mention chikungunya. Chikungunya is a viral disease. It's a nasty febrile disease. Uh, it's a bit like dengue, uh, but it, the sequels are, are, are more serious. You have severe arthritis that can last for months, even years. So, uh, in, 19, in 2005, uh, an outbreak of chikungunya appeared on the, on the Kenya coast, in Lamu, uh, on, on the Swahili coast. No great surprise, this is a virus that essentially is transmitted between monkeys in the forests. Uh, and if a person goes into the forest, gets bitten by an infected mosquito, and then goes into the city, there are mosquitoes like Albopictus and another species, Aedes aegypti, that uh, can transmit. And so you get an urban uh, outbreak. And that's what we saw from Lamu. We saw it going to, to uh, Mombasa, then to the Comoro Islands, then to Mayotte, uh, to, to Mauritius, and it, then we saw it in India. Now, of course, mosquitoes don't fly from uh, islands in the Indian Ocean to India, but this is the way that, the, uh, that the, the pandemic spread. And this was not very unusual. The unusual thing was that it, it occurred in a department, a département of France, essentially a, a county of France, the most southernmost county of France that's in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and so we had a pandemic. Uh, quite clearly, uh, quite clearly, uh, the vector of this uh, pandemic was not strictly the mosquito, it was uh, the Boeings and the Airbuses that move people around with viruses. And what was uh, really expectable was that it suddenly appeared in Europe. In one small uh, town called Castiglione, 
it appeared Castiglione was heavily infested with uh, Albopictus, with the, the tiger mosquito, and no great surprise there was transmission. This is an, a Google view of, of the town. You can see there's lots of nice trees there uh, and uh, lots and lots of Albopictus. But we got a statement from various people, including the World Health, Health Organization, who made a press statement saying, we cannot see that the disease was caused by climate change, but the conditions in Italy are now suitable for the tiger mosquito. I should have told you that the tiger mosquito is native as far north as Beijing in China, where it is extremely cold in the winter time. It survives in Chicago, which is not exactly a tropical city. Uh, there, are, there are infestations in, in, in Nebraska, etc. So there's no great surprise that it, it likes the Mediterranean climate of, 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 of northern Italy. Uh, nevertheless, there was a sort of relief. The lady who made this statement is a German, and she said there, there is no chance now that it will spread over the mountains to Germany because the temperature in the mountains is very low. Some kind of conception that the mosquitoes would actually fly over, over the, the, the Alps. So you can see that now, as I said, Boeing and Airbus, or should I say Airbus and Boeing, uh, are transmitting uh, uh, viruses, are uh, transporting viruses. So we have this quantum leap in the mobility of vectors and the mobility of viruses. You can see uh, some data here. I found the other day on the web that 1.2 million people, uh, Indians, or people travel to India and Pakistan from the United Kingdom every year two areas very often that are malarious. So you see those figures there. Essentially, people are moving around the world. Uh, there's no reason to say that temperatures were responsible for the, uh, for the chikungunya outbreak in, 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 uh, in Italy. You can see there's very, very little change in temperature. So let's go back to history. You can see these gravestones are essentially very similar to each other. And that is because most of the people died uh, very soon, one after the other. Now, previous to that, in, in the, 18th and, uh, the 17th and 18th century, we had the slave trade. The terrible conditions of the slaves aboard ships, uh, uh, Africans who were essentially uh, traded from inland in areas where yellow fever is endemic. The water storage on ships in, in, in barrels of water was quite clearly contaminated, was, was infested by mosquitoes. These mosquitoes loved to live in water, in water barrels. The virus was on board, and so, of course, there were terrible uh, epidemics even on board, and ships had to be quarantined for yellow fever, hence the yellow quarantine flag. And as you know, there was this the triangular trade from, from Europe down to, uh, to Africa, where they exchanged knives, etc., for humans. The humans were transmitted across to the New World, and they brought with them yellow fever. <clears throat> and you can see where the yellow fever outbreaks occurred. Just like chikungunya, they occurred also wherever the summer temperatures allowed transmission. And you can see Dublin and Cardiff and, and Boston and here in New York. In other words, places that are not too tropical. The biggest outbreak occurred in Memphis, and that cemetery has a mound uh, with 6,000 people, a mass burial of people who died of yellow fever. And as you can see, the, 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 the virus was transmitted uh, all over the place. I'm going to move to malaria now, and I'm going to make three points. First of all, I'm going to look at, at oh, I'm going to make three points that are made by the alarmists, by the activists in relation to malaria. First of all, that malaria will come to temperate regions. Uh, then there will be up to 500 million more cases in Africa, and that the disease is is spreading to higher altitudes. These are, by the way, the the, the diagram on the right-hand side, this was in Scientific American eight years ago, the same diagram was used by Mr. Gore um, in his film and his books. Uh, there are popular press, uh, there are popular press articles, and here is a WHO pass, uh, um, publication which quotes, uh, hundreds of millions more people will be exposed to malaria. Well, and the, the IPCC are saying that, uh, that malaria is limited to the tropics and subtropics. Well, this is the area where we had chikungunya transmission. Uh, you can see the meandering river through the village. 
and, and the flat field. This is a very flat area. It is the delta of the Po Valley, one of the most malarious places in Europe uh, in, until the beginning of the uh, middle of the 20th century, round, round about the 1950s. But in fact, malaria was not limited to the Mediterranean. Uh, we in Britain built <coughs> our Houses of Parliament in a malaria swamp. Um, it, it, it was cheap land. And your president, or whoever it was who, who, who selected uh, where the offices of government are, he followed British parliamentary president by putting your offices also in a, a malaria swamp. This is the distribution of malaria in the United States over, over several years. You can see it stops at the 49th parallel. That is actually not true. There was malaria in Canada as well. And it was only in, in really in the ninth, after World War II that the Communicable Disease Center was set up, uh, CDC, which later became the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In, the, in Europe, we had the Little Ice Age. Uh, this is a painting that was painted in, eight, uh, in 1560. 64, 65, the beginning of some of the coldest years when the king, the king used to go skating on the Thames. Uh, there were many times that the Thames uh, was frozen over. I have many quotes that I found. I enjoy doing this, finding quotes in the literature um, of the ague, which was malaria associated with brackish water marshes. And here is one from, from the, the Tempest where um, uh, uh, Sebastian is terrified because he sees this uh, very strange creature, Caliban. Caliban realizes that he's probably got an ague. Uh, he's in his fit now. He doesn't talk after the wisest. And then he'll give him alcohol. People used to give alcohol to at least allay some of the symptoms of, of malaria. William Harvey, I found to my surprise, had actually probably was the first person to demonstrate or to observe the changes in the consistency of the blood that occur in severe malaria, what we call uh, uh, cerebral malaria, where the capillaries get blocked up. And as he says, uh, the blood is forced into the lungs and rendered thick, exactly what happens, the, 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 the erythrocytes get stuck together. As I myself have seen in opening the bodies, his hospital was St. Thomas's Hospital, right opposite the Houses of Parliament. And a wonderful woman, Mary Dobson, uh, <coughs> supplied uh, <coughs> data on mortality in parishes, marsh parishes and non-marsh parishes, and you can see tremendously high mortality, which was directly attributable to, to, to mala aria, the bad air of the marshes. A man called Robert Tolber was the first to produce a really good malarial, anti-malarial therapy, uh, even in Europe, with, uh, with uh, quinine, in white wine. This is uh, his book on the causes, his ideas of the causes um, of agues, of malaria. Uh, and he, he actually became rich and famous, uh, curing the aristocracy all over Europe, particularly, for example, the Tsar in St. Petersburg, which was a notoriously malarious city. Here you see some graphs of the distribution of malaria in, fin in Sweden. Finland was also very heavily affected. Uh, and there was even transmission in Lapland. Um, I must go through this quickly. I'm sure that I need to, to accelerate. Uh, but this was a very interesting thing I found in a book by Daniel Defoe, where he saw a strange decay of the female sex uh, in, in the uh, marshlands. And basically, the men who lived in the marshlands and reared cattle there, uh, beef is supposedly very much more flavorful in, in marshland areas, uh, those people uh, they would get wives from the hilly countries. And when they brought the wives, uh, the uh, wives were wholesome, these women were wholesome and fresh and they were healthy and clear, but they seldom lasted for a year or so and then they died of malaria. So to these men, the, the men would go to the uplands again and fetch another woman. Uh, so that marrying of wives was reckoned a kind of good farm for them. So uh, that was what uh, the very last thing I'll say about malaria in temperate regions is that the, one of the biggest epidemics of all time on record was in the Soviet Union in 23, in 25, during the fantastic uh, uh, civil wars that were going on. And we had even, they had uh, 30,000 cases in Archangel, which is close to the Arctic Circle. So I think you should be convinced that we're not dealing with a tropical disease exclusively. Now I move on to uh, 
the claim that there will be perhaps 500 million more cases in, in, of malaria in Africa. Very, very quickly, I must distinguish for you between stable and unstable malaria. In, in many areas, stable malaria means that everybody gets infected by, inf uh, gets bitten by infected mosquitoes at least once a year. That's roughly uh, uh, stable malaria, meaning that everybody who is not immune, the newcomers, the, the children and uh, perhaps uh, people from, t from regions where there's no longer uh, malaria, um, they, uh, are the, the, those people are susceptible. The people that have survived malaria have a certain degree of immunity and their immunity is renewed every year. Unstable areas, transmission is very irregular. There may be years, several years, many years. It's very difficult to predict when there is no transmission, in which cases we have, uh, when the malaria comes, then you can have devastating ep epidemics. This is a map of Africa produced by a group partly financed by the World Health Organization. The areas in red are areas of stable transmission. In other words, those areas are perfectly okay for transmission to everybody every year. So where are the areas where there may be changes with changing climate? They are the fringe areas there. Uh, when the environmentalists talk about the advance of desertification, then we can imagine that that northern border will move southwards. In other words, there will be uh, epidemic malaria in that thin band of area, probably. But look, the majority of Africa already, the glass is full. You can't have any more uh, water in a glass if it's full. You pour water in and it pours over the edge. Now to the real obsession of the, 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 the alarmists, perhaps I take some of the credit, having fought them for more than 12 years, um, higher altitudes. Before I go on, I should say that malaria at higher altitudes is a red herring. Uh, John Christie helped me learn that the total surface area, not, not the the two-dimensional area, the total surface area of Africa that is above, uh, above 2,000 meters is 2% of the total area. In fact, what we're talking about in terms of creeping up to altitudes is uh, a very small part of sub-Saharan Africa. The various places you can see here uh, are the places where so it is said that there, there has been malaria uh, going to higher altitudes. Here's a quote from Mr. Gore. You may remember the animation in his film where the mosquitoes are crawling up the mountains. And he says, Nairobi, the, I, I can't imitate him like the other gentleman. Uh, I don't have the right accent. Um, Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, used to be above the mosquito line, the highest point at which mosquitoes can live. Well, Nairobi is at 1,600, as you see, and 8 meters uh, uh, above uh, sea level. Anopheles gambi, the most effective vector of malaria probably in the world, the maximum altitude is 3,000 meters. There's very little of Africa that is at 3,000. Now, let's talk about Nairobi very quickly. It was founded as a railroad camp. The British were building a railroad from Mombasa to Uganda. To, 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 to Uganda. Uh, so, as soon as they got there, uh, the Maasai, they called the place the place of cool waters, Nairobi, it's their language. It was so malarious and there were so many mosquitoes that the doctors of the health project tried to get the place moved because all the coolies, all the, the workers um, were coming down with malaria. There were five major ma malaria epidemics from after World War I until the 1950s when DDT managed to stamp it out. I found, uh, astonishingly, that the British colonial government put aside 40,000 uh, pounds in 1926 to control malaria in the Nairobi area. That's about a million dollars in today's money. That was in 1926. I don't really know where the environmentalists get this idea of mosquitoes crawling up to Nairobi. Today, malaria is fairly, when I asked, uh, when we were filming for the um, great global warming swindle, I asked um, some of my colleagues who work on malaria, who are really the world specialists in malaria, to direct me, direct us to a clinic where there were malaria cases. And, and my friend said, what are you talking about? There's bugger all malaria in Nairobi. So 
the other thing is that uh, records there show, show little sign of change of climate. I thought I'd give you from Mr. Gore's school book. He, he has a book for high school uh, students, slightly simplified from the high-tech book, uh, An Inconvenient. This is An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, and this is what he labels a mosquito. Now, if you look at this insect, you can see that the, uh, the part, the sticker is at the wrong end of the mosquito. This is actually a wasp. Uh, this is a wasp. <laughs> And this is a tsetse fly. He's right about his tsetse fly. I believe he probably, somebody caught this when it hit the windshield of a safari vehicle because you may notice it's got four legs. Insects have six. It's lost two of them. So, so not very good education for our children. He, here are the altitudes of malaria that are claimed to be the new altitudes due to climate change. And here are the recorded altitudes from 1880 to 1945. You can see that there's less malaria at altitude. Why do we have malaria? Uh, why, in fact, is malaria increasing in many parts of the, of the tropics? Deforestation creates a habitat. Sunlit, open sunlit pools are the principal, the favorite habitat of uh, Anopheles gambi, for example. Um, changes in agricultural pr uh, practices, for example, rice field, rice cultivation, irrigation. Movements of populations. When you have these terrible movements due to civil strife, for example, people who have not been living in malarious areas go into these terrible camps and there is horrific transmission of malaria. War and civil strife. Poverty. Poverty is essentially uh, the, the, the best associate with uh, malaria. We see very little malaria now in much of Southeast Asia, except, for example, in Laos, in Laos. Uh, but in Thailand, relatively small areas affected, as an example. Drug resistance, a problem, problem uh, which uh, is a continuous problem. It's essentially a, a selection because of very often improper use of anti-malarials. And of course, insecticide resistance is a problem as well. Just one more uh, issue on, um, uh, on a disease at, at altitude. In 1992-93, uh, there was an outbreak uh, of yellow fever in western Kenya. You see here a, 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 cl a classic place for, for malaria, uh, for, for yellow fever. The monkeys in the forest, people going to the forest, Terrific. People go into the forest, get uh, yellow fever, and, and, uh, uh, and that's the way they, we call it sylvatic fever. The, the, the outbreak was in the Cario Valley. Um, Paul Epstein, one of the big alarmists, said it was due to Aedes aegypti moving up to mountains. I led the uh, investigation. What we found was that there were no aegypti at all present in the villages, and we identified the vectors. As I've said, less than 2%, or so that seems to have come again. People are worried about malaria because people are worried about tropical dangers. And the alarmists use this uh, as their particular weapon to scare people. One thing that's interesting is they never mention the other tropical diseases, which unfortunately the, the public know little about. Trypanosomiasis, uh, sleeping sickness, river blindness, elephantiasis, leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, loa loa. I bet you haven't heard of most of those, um, but but uh, they are major diseases which are never mentioned in the global warming uh, issue. Uh, very, very quickly, I'll just run through what happened with, uh, with West Nile virus when it was accidentally imported to the States. According to the alarmists, there is a, a climate factor in this. I don't know if you can see any more transmission in the southern United States compared to the northern United States. So what we have, to my mind, is a very serious situation. People are misusing the language of science in my field and in many other fields, essentially to, uh, to uh, inform the public and misinform the public. And my last slides, I promise you, are uh, three uh, quotes from people who survived the Stalinist purges. Um, one man I, who I uh, um, admire greatly, Valery Soifer, wrote the definitive uh, biography of Trofim Lysenko. Um, I, I should, I'm sorry, I've, I've uh, jumped myself. There was a, a, a 
I better skip this, but basically we had a meeting in Moscow where Andrei Ilarionov condemned the British government for being totalitarians who were trying to censor dissidents. I, I, I never thought I would be in the Kremlin and defended as a dissident. Um, in his book, he wrote, Lysenko discovered how little it took to capture the imagination of journalists in search of a sensation. Does that sound familiar? Lysenkoism showed how a forcibly instilled illusion repeated over and over at meetings and in the media takes on an existence of its own in people's minds despite all realities. Does that sound familiar? And lastly, but not least, uh, the great uh, physicist, nuclear physicist Semyonov, Nobel Prize winner, wrote, there is nothing more dangerous than blind passion in science. There is, this is a direct path to unjustified self-confidence, to loss of self-criticalness, to scientific fanaticism, and to false science. Given the support of someone in power, it can lead to suppression of true science. And since science is now a matter of state importance, to inflicting great in injury on the country. That was after the fall of Khrushchev during the, the short thaw. I leave you with that thought. Did I make it in 20 minutes? You're fine. Great. Thank you. <clears throat>